Shackleton was a contemporary of, of, of Scott and Amundsen. Scott and Amundsen, of course, had vied to be the first to the pole. Scott got there narrowly after Amundsen, of course, died along with all of his men on the attempted return. And, and Amundsen was lauded as the great hero, and Scott a great hero too for having made the ultimate sacrifice. But Shackleton had decided to do one better, which was to cross the whole of the Antarctic, with the pole just being midway. And when he didn't manage to land his ship because it was crushed, he then undertook a journey, ironically, that was far more challenging, far more challenging than the original would have been. I can say that because I've crossed Antarctica on foot on the journey that he originally intended to do, and I got almost all the way to the other side before a fuel leak uh, ruined my chances of doing the whole thing. And no one has ever done it to this day, the whole crossing. But I think it was within my physical wherewithal to do it. But the journey that we've just done, that he was forced to do and we've just replicated, was a far more difficult undertaking. And so in, you know, he's a showman. In typical fashion, he set out to do one thing and the thing he ended up doing was just so much more than even he could have possibly imagined. And he saved everybody. As soon as you scratch the surface of this polar world, you realise that he is regarded as the greatest bar none. Not only was it life-threatening and desperate and miserable, but it was boring and it was challenging and it was over such an extended period. It took a year for the boat to sink and they were out on the ice for four months. And then they paddled across 50 miles of open ocean to them four days, you know, against currents that were going the wrong way. And, and then he had to leave 22 men on the island and they were thinking, we may never be rescued. Why should we work together? It's a recipe to take from the other, and instead they held together. Every element of the journey required skills that none of the other polar explorers possessed. This ability to identify with everybody, understand their motivations, be compassionate towards them when they needed to be, firm when they needed to be, fun when they needed to be, you know, optimistic. It's the, the greatest survival journey of all time, I've no doubt about that. The expedition is retracing Ernest Shackleton's journey of survival that he undertook in 1916. I've got two round the world sailors. One's an Aussie called Paul Larson. He's number two to a skipper called Nick Bubb. Then there's the head of outdoor survival for the Royal Marines, a guy called Barry Gray. Uh, there's another guy from the Royal Navy called Seb Coulthard, who's done a lot of the retrofitting of the boat. And then the final guy is the cameraman, and he has summited Everest twice and used to be the UK free diving champion. We've trialled our little boat in the roughest conditions we could find. It was a boat without a keel, uh, 100 year old technology, and they were only in it out of desperation. It was the lifeboat, essentially. For six men, it's, it's hopeless. The, the living area below is about the size of a dining table. It's a very, very cramped, very, very rough ride. It's like a washing machine. We'll take it down and we'll do some sea trialling when we get to Antarctica before we set off on the expedition. We're going to try and this is a glacier snout here. I must say four years into the planning of this, which is what these things normally take, and I'm really ready to just go and do it uh, rather than continue to try and research it and plan it. Stand by bars to row normally. Okay, let's go. Okay, and punching off. Row, 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 row. Hold on, chaps. Hey! <laughs> Hold on, Paul. After day one, you've already had enough. You know, you have absolutely zero personal space. You know, we waterproofed these very primitive cotton outer layers, which are designed really to keep the wind off as best we could with dubbing and fat and grease and that sort of stuff. First wave came in. I was drenched, you know, and the four woolen layers I had on underneath that layer were then wet for the rest of the trip. And you're lying there trying to, trying to get body heat from, your, from yourself to dry your own clothes and from the others you're lying in amongst. And you open the hatch to get on deck and there's a storm. And the temperature is two degrees, one degree, minus two, and the wind is blowing at 50 knots and the seas are 30 foot and it's like being handed the wheel of a car having been asleep in the passenger seat and said, you know, you take over when you're in the middle of a controlled skid. You know, you're in these dark valleys looking up, hoping these waves will not break on you or tip you over. You know, it's really a terrifying experience, particularly for a non-sailor. 
but even for the sailors, they were thinking, wow, you know. Um, so we had storms for three or four days out of 11, which is a lot when you're in amongst it and you have no respite. And when we arrived at South Georgia, ironically, instead of the big storm that Shackleton had the day he got there, we had mist, which actually is almost equally bad because if you, if you still have big seas pushing you towards the rocky outline of the island, you can hear the breakers, but you can't see it in the mist. You, know, you spend all this time trying to get to South Georgia and suddenly you just do not want to be there. You, know, you want to be as far away as possible.